Hey, everybody. What is up? Toby Salgado, Super Agents Live. Glad you tuned in today. If you are new to the show, I'm glad you found it, and I'll tell you very briefly what we do. This show is about entrepreneurship, and we talk about entrepreneurship through the lens of a real estate agent. But really, again, whatever, if you're a plumber, pie maker, painter, whatever, the stuff we talk about will help you. Now, before we get to the content, now today's episode, really, really briefly, I got this Italian guy from New York on, um, pretty good stuff in this. He does have an accent, so I hope that's not too, too distracting for you guys. Um, I didn't, I don't think I can't, um, I didn't have a hard time with it, but I think you're going to love it. Now, before we get to the content, I want to go on a little bit of a rant. Now, if you, uh, if you don't want to hear my rant, that's okay. Just fast forward to the content. Um, but here's what this rant little thing is about. If you're listening to this show, the day it airs, it's going to air December 9th, 2014. Now, why is that? at all important. Um, there's two things. Number one, I hope, I really hope that you guys have put some time thinking about your 2015. What does that look like for you professionally, for you personally? Number two, uh, that's somewhat important because we're coming up right on our one year anniversary. I've done 106 year, seven year, whatever, uh, uh, interviews. Um, we haven't released all of them, obviously. And man, you know, this show has gone through this really, really uh, big growth phase. Um, and look, I've grown as well, obviously. You can't not help grow uh, when, you, when, you t when you have these people that, you know, that are on the show in my life. And I hope that you've grown. And, I, and I've seen growth from you guys and girls, whatever. Um, I've seen personal growth. I've seen professional growth. I, I, I've gotten to know a lot of you through through Twitter or through email or whatever. You know, I, I know where you live. I know what your business looks like. I, you know, I've helped you, hopefully. That's great. And I hope that I can continue to help you. I want to continue to add value. Now, if I look back on our 2014, you know, I've amassed 40,000 faithful listeners. Thank you guys. Um, you know, we've been in what's hot and iTunes, you know, we're top 100 business show in the world on both, on both iTunes and Stitcher. Uh, that is very humbling. And I'm very honored that you guys have, have helped us get there. Now, 2014 for me was all about, about grow user, you know, audience base, uh, all that stuff. And again, hopefully, me earning a little bit of respect in the in the world of real estate, you know, and getting to know some of the some of the top top people. Um, I'll, I'll share with you really quickly my 2015. What 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 does 2015 look like for me? 2015 is going to be about monetization. Now, if you look back in 2014, I've never asked you to buy anything. You know, you go to the site today. There's nothing for sale on it. And again, that was deliberate. Uh, it was deliberate because I wanted to earn your trust, and I hopefully I have it. Now, and even uh, 2014, um, I, I've I literally had one paying sponsor, and, and I turn sponsors down every week uh, because, you know, I want to be careful about who I endorse. So, so 2015 for this show is I'm going to start to monetize it. Now, and let me say it this way. I'm going to start to monetize the platform. So, obviously, if you've been listening, we have a radio division, right? Putting people, radio works. Radio is a crazy medium. So, we're building that out. And for, for the radio arm of this platform, uh, you know, my goal is to have 100 clients. That's all I want. I want 100 clients. And uh, in terms of average spin and all that, so, you know, what will that earn me? That will be, you know, I'll earn about, you know, 60 grand GCI or what is that? 720 grand uh, 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 top line. Now, most of that will be net because we don't have a huge overhead, you know, you know, three or four VAs and that's about it. So yeah. So, so this year from the radio arm, I want to make about 750 grand from the platform itself. I'd love to make another 200 or 300 grand. And, and what does that mean? That means this, we may start to get some sponsors. So I may put you through, you know, a minute or so of uh, me saying, Hey, go out and check this, this, this product or service out. So that's one way we can earn some money. The, the other way is I really do want to help you guys. I want to, I want to change your business. I want to help you guys have a better life, have a better business. Now, what can I do? What can the show do 
to help you? What do you need? Is there a product or service out in the marketplace that that doesn't exist or that does exist, but it's super crappy and, and you would like us to get it better? Now, let me tell you something. If I look at the industry and who's doing what, we are light years ahead of everybody else. In my opinion, most real estate agents, at whether it's whether it's you know vendors, service providers, or whatever, they're they're either very very extremely narrow, or two, they're just they just don't know tech, man. They they don't know what twenty fifth you know the, the, what year we're in, you know. So, what product or service would you like me to create that you would? put your hand in your pocket and say, Toby, I'll pay for that. Um, what questions am I not covering? What topics am I not covering? What, what, how can I help you? I really want to know. Let me throw out an idea. Now, this is an idea that I don't know if we're going to do. We probably won't, but it, it, I thought about it last night, and um, I thought I'd run it by you today. And it's this. It's about the world of coaching. Now, I, I don't – if any of my coaching friends are listening to this, I don't want to be a coach. I have no interest in, 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 in building a coaching arm of this show out at all. What I would rather do is be an intermediary between the, the coaches and the person that, that needs coaching. Now, obviously, you know coaching is important. The problem that I see – there's two problems I see in the, in the world of coaching today. And one is many of these companies, they're, they're literally sales machines. Right, they do all these events, which that's fine, uh, and then then they, they you know, and then basically they want you to get in their funnel, and once you get into their funnel, they are brutal, man. You're gonna get a call every two days. I don't think that's a great way of operating. Two, what what I perceive as a problem, and listen, if you're a coach and you disagree with us, that's fine. I'm not picking on you. I'm not saying any names, but people want to make you sign a 12 month contract. Ah, man, you know, asking me to sign a 12 month contract and, and not even allowing me to talk with the person that I'm going to, or, or prior to, to me talking with the person that's actually going to coach me at your organization, I think is bad business. Now, the, here's the deal there's 20 different coaches, you know, Eric, Sue, Mary, Dick, Jane out there for you as the consumer to choose from. How do you know if they're any good? You don't. You know, and at the end of the day, I know them better than you do because they've been on my show. I, I talk with many of these people offline. You know, I trade a lot of emails with a lot of these people. I know them better than you do. So what if we had a service? What if we had a service and instead of going right to the coach, you went to us? And, and, you, and we, you, know, you went through a process of, okay, this is what I'm good at. This is what I'm weak at. This is where I wanna, what I want to look like in, in, in a year from now, whatever. And we put you through our matrix from what we know from these coaches. And we said, hey, listen, from everything you've told us, you know, um, uh, Sheila Smith is the best coach for you. And, and by the way, we think you should be with Sheila for about five months. We want you to get these skills. And then for the next uh, – for the rest of that year, you should move to, to you know, Patricia Smith. Um, now, I don't know if we can monetize that. Um, uh, I don't even know if these coaches would – would allow us to mess with their contracts or anything. But to me, it seems like a good idea. Um, and, and, and it seems to, to like a good idea from my viewpoint because, again, I hope that you trust us. Um, and I hope that, that you would can see that, you know, we probably could f- pair you with the right coach rather than you just getting into a bra- all these conversations and then people, you know, calling you or whatever. So let me know what you think. Um, uh, and by the way, look – if you haven't signed up for our membership site, go sign up. If you haven't downloaded my free ebook, go get it. Um, all you have to do is give me your email. It's free for both those things. And thirdly, if you have not subscribed to the show on iTunes or Stitcher, go do that, please. And you know what? If you like the show, leave us a rating and review. All right. So uh, that's what my 2015 is going to look like. It's going to be the year of monetization. What is your 2015 going to look like? Send me an email. Let me know what you think. Hey, let's get to the show. Welcome to Super Agents Live. This is the one place where you can come and hear the most successful people in real estate. You'll hear how these super agents built their businesses, how they stay productive, and how they stay motivated. Who am I? My name's Toby Salgado, and I made my first million in real estate. Yeah. And I'm your host for the next 30 minutes while we talk to yet another amazing real estate yeah. entrepreneur. Stay tuned. Let's go. Yeah. 
Today on the show, I'm thrilled to talk with my next guest. Now, this guy is in New York City, uh, has a team of 25 people. Uh, last year or this year is going to end up with 200 transactions for a total volume of $100 million. I'm thrilled to welcome Richard Nassimi. Hey, Richard, thanks for taking the time out, man. Thank you, Toby. Thank you very much for having me. So now listen, so, so I gave the audience a brief overview of what your business kind of looks like. But before we get there, you know, you're this a guy from, you know, with an Italian accent in New York City. Uh, take a minute. Tell us a little bit about yourself, and then we'll get into your business. Well, my life, it's uh, quite very, I would say, simple but complicated. I came in America in 1997. Uh, right away, I started in the diamond industry because that was uh, from my family. My father was a pioneer of diamonds and precious stones in Italy since the 1960 when he moved out of Iran in the 1961 with my mother, and he started right away into gemstone. I wasn't fond about it, but, you know, family business, right, Toby? Sure, absolutely. He, <laughs> he took over. So I then I immigrated here with my mom and my brother because my father passed away in 1997, on a November, during the winter, we came here, and we started right away in the middle of 47th Street, which is the heart of the diamond industry of New York and America. We started right away there into the diamond business. Hmm. Yes, it was like a very tough area because, you know, as well-renowned the area it is, people know it's a very cut uh, street. Not that real estate is uh, easier or walk in the park, but again... You know, there it's very tough. But we started there. In the first two, three years, we were happy. We were having a very good economy, very good sales. Uh, I was kind of okay in it, but I was always mesmerized by the buildings, by the surroundings, and I see all these towers. Obviously, nowadays, the skyline is completely changing since 2000. But back then, already, there were office towers, and I was saying, oh, my gosh, you need people to buy, people to move, people to leave. It's a continuous traffic in New York City, nonstop, very, very evolutional and fast-paced, and I loved it. So in 2005, my company started, uh, you know, so-so, and I decided just to leave because it was about time. I got married, and the first thing I did is, like, okay, I want to get into, say, real estate, but I don't want to go into business and run after client and, you know, beg them for business. Right. Making them believe that I'm the best. You understand what I'm yeah, saying, Toby? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I wasn't looking for that. I wanted to build a long-standing business where people knew that I was a very good broker. You know, I would bring the good product, the good income for investors, for people living in it, here and there. So I, was, I took a job as a general manager at a restaurant famous, Cafe Fiorello, which is right across the Lincoln Center, Italian Brasserie. And I was working for a big, uh, you know, restaurateur. His name is Shelly Fireman, very renowned. But during the mornings, I was working as a real estate broker, Monday through Friday. And at night, from 4 to 2 a.m., I was working in the restaurant business. Oh, wow, man. Yes, exactly, Toby. So I was working from, let's say, about 18 hours a day, 19 hours a day. Oh. And the, yeah, and the weekend on Saturday, I would relax, but then on Sunday, I would work in real estate, but I also had a little team of contractors, you know, to do some uh, repair job in my town of Great Neck to make some, you know, extra money and learn the, even the business of construction. So I was a hands-on. And then finally, slowly, 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 I, you know, I started to make deals bigger. Then I started to, you know, get uh, other brokerage to call me, to come and join their company. Until then, I landed to Corcoran for four years and a half, where I became director of sales in many different various buildings. Hmm. I did the consulting with the developer, and now, you know, now we have our own corporation, our own company, which is segmented in three ways. But uh, before getting that, I wanted to give you a little history until today. No, I appreciate that. And, and that, I mean, you, you have, uh, uh, I mean, it's a very interesting history to me. And, and the first thing that pops out at me is, you know, you are, you know, they, they talk about, uh, America, you know, America is the land where you can do anything, and and it's God bless America. Yeah, and it's but you know what? The people who are coming out and making it big, they are immigrants. They're you know, it's not necessarily the people that you know, regular uh, Americans. It's the it's the immigrants who came from another country who have, uh, have a strong work ethic that buckle down and do whatever it is. You know, they open up a Seven Eleven or whatever. Now, now, Toby, uh, Toby, uh, America is about immigration. America was founded on immigration. Right. 
No, I agree. I agree. And I don't want to get political because, I mean, I have my, my thoughts on, you know, immigration, especially <laughs> with, you know, what, you know, of course. what the administration is doing. But, but, but look, let, let's go back to the diamond industry because I've never, yeah. I've never talked with someone in your shoes. Um, I have bought diamonds from, from a New York guy. I'll tell you, let me tell you a quick story. And I, this is amazing to me. This, this is back in 1999. Um, I'm going to get engaged. Uh, I, I, go, I do a search on the internet for diamonds, right? I want to learn about them to know what I'm buying. And then I end up, I end up basically through a site, I'm talking with some old, you know, a Jewish guy in New York, and we talk about what I want. And I say, okay, this is what I want. This guy, Richard, he's like, okay, I have a carrot and a half, and it's this, you know, VVS, whatever. I, I, I don't remember what it was. But he's like, I will give me your address. I'll send it to you and you can check it out. This guy, I gave him no credit card. He doesn't know who I am. Sends me a car- a $7,000 diamond with mm-hmm. with the, the the you know the the certificate, you know, th- you know what um, you know what I'm talking about. In the yeah. mail. In the mail. And I I, yeah. I I could have run off with a thing. I didn't. I sent it back and got another one, but have you ever heard of such a thing? I, I to this day I don't know why that guy did that. It's very curious and peculiar hearing it from a direct client. I was in the industry as a wholesaler, but it's very, very interesting to hear this view from like a client, an outsider, which are you are the end user. Well, let me tell you, in the diamond industry, one thing which is very fascinating, and that comes from the old ages. I'm talking to you about centuries ago. The most important thing between diamond dealers and when they give to each other diamonds was the shake of hand. It would be more than a signature. See, Toby, a diamond, right? Let's say, let's get an example, five carats, right? Mm. Five carats is big, like maybe your half your pinky, even less. Yeah. Let's say one third of your pinky, right? Let's make it like a, a universal measurement, correct? Okay. So in that one, in that little piece of rock, you have about, let's say, nearly maybe even $100,000, depending from the clarity, great, I'm not sure how well educated you are in the diamond section, but it can range the varies of price. Yeah, okay? yeah. But let's say for Color, instance, cut, clarity, right? The three C's. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Very good. I see the internet has overruled everything now. <laughs> Back in the 2000, <laughs> people, you have to teach them. Now you go on Google, you find everything. Yeah. So you have $100,000. You know, it's not a house. A house, you can take it away, steal it. Yeah. You know, you can't put it on your shoulder and run away. A diamond, you can. You yeah. can put together 10, 20 diamonds and run away. So even if you sign papers, you can put yourself a portfolio of like maybe $10 million if you have a good credit. You understand what I'm yeah. saying? In, yeah. in the market, in the, <clears throat> excuse me, in the round, if they know you, they would give it to you. So that's why the main important thing was the trust. Your word was very important in the industry. Shake of hand, which I translated, <clears throat> excuse me, into real estate also. Because, you know, yes, we have contract. Yes, you have agreements, right? But at the end of the day, in the diamond, especially in the diamond industry, it means nothing. You can still take away those goods, and it's very easy to take them away. It's not even a piece of art from Picasso that you have yeah. to, you know, <clears throat> put in a container and then ship it. It's just pieces of diamonds, rocks that you can put together and just leave, you know, and there's nothing you can do. So that's why that was the trust and the trust translates with the end user. And we, whoever was in the diamond industry, comes to real estate and love the fact that there's contracts, agreements, but still, we still have that nostalgia, right? Yeah. Of the shake of hands. Yeah. Again, you know? again, I, and, I, and again, I, I just talked to this guy on the phone. I just, I, I, I you know, I, and, and look, I felt I, I, it, it, it induced a weird feeling for me, you know, cause this guy did trust me with a, you know, $7,500 rock that I could have taken away. He didn't know who I was. I could, I could have given him a fake name. Who knows? Um, and, but I sent it back. It wasn't the right one for me. And I sent it back and I was sweating the whole time, you know, worried that something's going to happen in the mail. And then he sent me another one. So, so look, here, here's what I want to know from you, Richard. Right? So you, the diamond industry is a very difficult business to get into, right? To break Correct. into it, you know, Correct. but, but you, you were successful in breaking into the diamond industry. What kind of things did you do to break into the diamond industry? And, and, and how did you use that then to break into real estate in a big way? Well, let me, let me kind of correct you a little bit. I was successful in the first years, but then after that, I didn't like it anymore, so I really stopped even following it, and I got out. But in the first years, we were very successful. It's all about the old art of selling. 
Mm. Because you know what? In real estate, you have assets, and it's more real and tangible. In diamonds, especially in those days when the internet was not so strong like today, people need to be educated, and they need to trust you, and they need to know that you know, if you're selling something, it's like you have to own it, because the only way to sell it is like if it's yours. You know every corner of it, correct? Yep. So if a client comes there and he wants to buy a diamond, you know, it's even harder because, you know, it's a commodity, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a luxury. It's the last of the wheel that you're going to purchase, you know. It's not like the first thing you're going to go and buy. So it's a very tough uh, selling point. I, I, I say it's the Harvard of, uh, of the, the business, of the selling. It's the Harvard of selling, I can call it, mm. you know, okay. where you go to, to the toughest college to learn how to do the master of selling. Once you get out of that, uh, I think... <laughs> Any other business, it's not easier, but, you know, you have a very big baggage behind you of knowledge and skills that, you know, when you translate them into real estate, not that you're going to sell tomorrow morning, but, you know, real estate is very tangible. People, any person with some money or even no, going to make a mortgage, going to buy an apartment because they need to live it or they want to invest, right? So yeah. they need an apartment. They need a building. It's not a luxury. It's a necessity. They need to rent. Okay, so mix that necessity plus the magical art of selling. Mm. Mm. It's a you know explosive mixture. I agree. So so uh, and, and and this is what I want to get in learn from you, Richard. Uh, is is how did you learn that magical art of selling, and what are some of the things that you took out of? Because I'll tell you this: even in this conversation, I mean, you've drawn me, and I'm sure you've drawn the audience in the whole way. But you know, you keep asking me questions. You you, you say something, you go, "Isn't that right, Toby?" That's a sales technique, and, and you're 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 you know, you are you've done it to me three or four times, and I'm I'm okay with it. But I mean, it's probably so ingrained in you, Richard, that you know this yeah. art of selling. How did you learn your craft in that regard? Well, look, uh, I have to tell you something, Toby. First of all, my questioning, it's always because I like to hear views of other people. Because I, I you know, I, you learn, you grow by knowing other people's opinion. In, in real estate, when I sit down with my investor, I'm not going to tell my investor, hey, this is the best apartment, this has the best return, grab it. If not, you lose it. I sit down and tell them, this is it, but let me hear your comments. Mm. Now, let's go back one step. The art of selling. The art of selling, it's 50-50%. 50% is on the ground, dealing with people, dealing with uh, end user. You have to feel them. You have to understand them. You have to uh, get their inside of them, what they want to do, what, how they live, how they breathe. Once you're inside the customer, you understand what is the product. The secret is not selling something. The secret is understanding what the person wants. Mm. That's the biggest secret, you know, and I learned it by knowledge, you know, by time, by being on the field, always in contact with clients, and many of them, they're one of the hardest people there is around, like, you know, the impossible buyers, right. the buyers that whatever you do, they're always going to find something to tell you, hey, no, it's not enough, hey, no, it's not enough, the price, I want more, I want a certificate, I want the free C cut, I want flawless, no, right. you know, so you... You, you have to learn to accommodate men. It's all about hospitality. That also, I want to tell you, translate also from the restaurant business as general manager, I learned. But getting back, that's 50%. The other 50%, I think it's just DNA, to be honest. Yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting that you, I, I would, I would agree with you uh, w w with that last piece. You know, DNA and just you know, it's just being who you are. So, listen, I'm a great sales guy, and I've since I was a kid, I was a great sales guy. But l let me ask you this, Richard. So you know, fifty percent, half of it is getting to know what they want, uncovering you know their their desires. What are the? How do you do that? How do you you know you personally, Richard? How do you if we, you and I sat down? Okay. Okay, how would you do that without, you know, it being... Uh, look, Toby, hey, look, Toby, look, Toby, uh, let me see something. Like, for example, when you have a kid, right? Yeah. Your kids, you have kids? Yeah, I have three. Good, I have three girls, myself too, okay? okay? So, uh, there's two ways you can deal with them, especially nowadays. It's when they go crazy, deal with them. Or fight with them, right? Right. You have yeah. two choices. Yeah. There, there's no, there's no other boundary. There's no like, uh, the, you cannot get any prisoners. It's their way or your way. But your way would be hitting a wall because they're gonna be become more reckless and more upset, right? Yep. So, the secret is 
you have to understand, every time my, my brokers or my developers or people that want to partner up with me, they tell me, Rich, we have a person which is perfect for you. I tell them I want to see him face to face or I want to talk to him on the phone because you can understand by emotion, by feelings, by the way they talk, by their body expression and their language. There's many things you can learn from the person when you see him face to face by the way he dresses. By the way, he takes care of himself. Well, by the way, he doesn't care. You know, it's not like it's a default, but by that, you can understand everything about a person. I have a, in, I have a lot of bad things in my, myself, a lot of like negative things. But one thing I have, and I call that upon myself, I have a scary judge of talent. Like, I can see people in within two to three minutes when they're sitting in front of me. I can understand where they're going to go and what we're doing and what they want. I, I train myself, and every time I sit with a client, I'm not just staring and listening to talk. I am understanding what they want, and that gets better every time. It's like psychologists. Psychologists see, what, a thousand patients a year? Uh, obviously, you're going to become a master in understanding by people, seeing every person, how his acts are, how his modus operandi of life is, you know? That's the way they're going to learn. That's the way you get better. You know, the Japanese have the best culture in the world. You know why? Why? They wake up in the morning. The first thing they do, they, have, they see how they can perfection what already they did yesterday. Mm. They perfection every day. They don't stop. They try to get perfection. Perfection is not a point. It's a marathon. You're never going to get to perfection. Right. Right. It's not something you get there. It's like a long, long, long walk. You're going to learn, you're going to see, but you have to be always eyes open. You know, I always think that we here in my office try to always go towards perfection because you know what? We're never going to achieve perfection, but excellency is the second step. That's what we're going to get yeah. achieved. Now that reminds me of uh, Jim Collins, good to great. I want to go back for a second. So you have this scary talent, right? In two or three minutes, you can really get a measure of people. And, and, and I will tell you, for me, I think I have something similar. I, I can do it with groups. You know, I do a lot of public speaking and I can, I can literally, nobody's talking with me, but I can look at the crowd and I can know, oh, I just lost them, you know, t- t- 15 seconds ago. And then I work to win them back. Um, if you have that talent, Richard, I mean, the next step is to, to, you know, if you can really get a sense of who they are and what drives them and, you know, the next step is to, to then influence them. Uh, talk to me about, about how you influence people or do you? Okay, I prefer to call it differently. Totally. Okay, okay. Influence uh, to me sounds, uh, I know you, what you mean by it. You know, you mean it in a positive way. Yeah. Influence in the sense, but I think influence is a negative term. Okay. Lead them. Lead them is a better word, I think. Okay, yeah. How, how we want to lead the crowd. How do we lead the crowd? See, when you have one person is one-to-one, correct? Yep. So you have in front one person, he likes pizza, he doesn't like steak. So you know where it's going to go, right? Mm-hmm. When you have a crowd of uh, 20 people, you're dealing with a different kind of crowd emotion, right? Yes. So the secret is you have to be the leader. They cannot have their own decision or judgment by themselves because then you're going to have like democracy, 20 votes, right? Mm-hmm. And mind you, you might end up with like 18 different votes, you know, on, about what we're doing. You have to be the leader. You know, the leader, when he shouts, the word with the strength and the passion of the way he shouts the word, necessarily the word doesn't have to be strength, but the way you do it, people will follow you or will not follow you. Interesting. So the way you shout it is the most important. You can say money and people are going to be like, oh, okay, sure. You know, but if you say with passion, money, people will follow you. Yeah. That's a big difference. So, so you have a team of 25. Um, I, I'm sure you... And we're growing. And, and we're growing. Yeah, and, and look, and, and at the end, we'll, we'll, let's, we'll, we'll give you a shout out and hopefully, you know, um, I, we, I do have New York listeners, so, you know, we'll, we'll see if we can get the phone ringing for you guys. But w- w- in terms of, you know, you being a leader, you know, and you being passionate about, about growing a team and growing this business, w- how do you, do you think that, that you are a great leader? Uh, and I'm, that may not be the right question for you, but, but you can take that wherever you think you want to go. Well, uh, thank you very much, Toby, for the great leader. I pref- yeah, I, I thank you very much. I always try to keep my ego low, and it's always very good to hear that. <laughs> Let's just call myself leader. The leader, I, um, I like to take the when, – whenever there's something wrong, I always don't blame it on my agents. Don't blame it on my employees. I blame it upon me. And when things go right, we're all a team. 
That's the first thing I do. I never, never, never see things in a negative way. When things happen which are not positive, we need to study them, and we're going to make it twice as positive as instead of being negative. Hmm. We always look things, yes. An obstacle are never bigger than us. We are bigger than every single obstacle. So there's no obstacle that would stop us. If we focus, if we're determined, and we set a goal, failure is impossible. So we are together. And any of my agents, no matter how busy I am, no matter how taken I am, no matter how many deals I have on my table, and how many joint ventures I'm doing, no matter what I'm doing, if they need me, I'll find the time to meet them and sit down for five minutes. No matter how small or futile the question is according to them, I do not care because nothing to me is futile. Everything is important. It's always a learning curve for them and for me. You yeah. know, yeah. once it's said, rich people always want to learn. Poor people think they always know. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great line. And listen, we have a great uh, following on Twitter. So I, 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 whoever's listening, I want, I, want the, I want to see that on Twitter. Uh, poor sure. people always think they know and rich people always want to learn. So, so, you're, you know, so your personal motto or your business motto is you know, personal responsibility. And you're the guy... Um, you know, I, I, I love that notion that if something goes wrong, you take responsibility for it. And, and what that says to me about the, the culture you've built, Richard, is that, you know, you don't sit at the top and say, hey, I'm the boss and you should, right? You have this inverted thing where, you know, you're at the bottom and, and you know, you're there to support your people, not, not, not tell them what to do. Yeah, like a father, like yeah. a, you know, like a father of the kids. If the kid goes wrong, what are you going to do? You're going to say your daughter or your son, hey, yeah, yeah, take my son, my daughter, punish them. Of course you will not do that. Why would you? It's nature. I would never do that to my agents. I would go there in front. If they did something wrong, in front, I would always protect them. I will always tell them, listen, okay, it happened to the other person. We can fix it. Inside the house, I would talk to them and get even mad with them. But this is between inside the family. On the outside, I would never make them feel low or bash them. I will always be the protector. Obviously, being realistic, you know, if someone does something that is not correct, you have to be also kind of like apologetic or like discuss it, not saying, no, that's not correct, that's not true. You have to admit guilt uh, if it ever happens or if something doesn't go right. But it, it, the most important thing is that you discuss it in-house, you know, like a true leader does. And true leaders don't get, go there and brag, I'm the president and CEO. Right. Because people know who they are. You don't need to tell them who, right. they, who you are. Right. And that's what I do. I don't need to go and tell every, everyone who I am. You know, I don't want to tell them. And I don't have the time to tell them. Right. And I don't want to have the time to tell them. <laughs> right. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, Toby? I do. I do. Well, look, look it, trying to get a sense of you are who you are. And, and this, uh, this, is, this, is a really, this is a different interview than I normally do, but this is really fun for me. So, so you know, you immigrated here with your mom and with your, your father passed. Um, are you the oldest, Richard? No, I'm the youngest. You're the uh, youngest? Only me and my brother. Yeah. My huh. brother, Philip, is still in Diamond. He's still in the business. It's interesting to me that, you know, you have this, you know, this, this very strong sense. And again, maybe this is because of your, your, you know, your blood, right? Because you are an immigrant, you know, this, uh, you know, being the youngest, you know, you know, you said, hey, uh, you know, like a father, do it in-house. It's this, this familial thing to me is I would have thought that you were the oldest, but. Um, no. So, no. so no. Um, a few times in this, in this conversation, um, you've, you've. Uh, talked about language, right? I said, I said influence, and you said, let's say leadership. How important is, and, and again, you, this emphasis on being positive, how important is language to you and, and, and the culture that you built there? Well, Toby, let me make you an example. Are you ready to hear that? Yeah, well, I'm, I can't wait. Okay. When I tell you right now, hey, Toby, let's go to war. What does he tell you? We're going to war, right? Yeah. I say, Toby, let's discuss about the war. What does he tell you? We want to talk about it, correct? Yep. Huge difference. You're talking about two huge differences. Language, it's very important. Because the word you use influence the outcome, the results. You have to be very careful. And then it becomes natural. You know, you can even be systematically a computer that everything you say, you sound like a telemarketer. You have to be with the flow and logical. But you have to be careful also the words you use because any word, it's like an arrow. You know, when you aim with the arrow, right? You aim, you're ready to let the arrow go. A little deviation at the beginning 
can make a big miss of disproportion way. It can go the opposite way, right? Right. Yeah. A little mistake. Same thing, the words or how we act, how we sit down in a meeting, how you talk. It's very important. It's very important. The, the terms you use, you know, some people, they want, they sit down with me when I sit with all the bankers and we're talking about refinancing one of the buildings and they sit down, they talk with all those term, terminology, frothy, uh, or EBITDA, all these kind of things and they get all about, you know, happy about that. But I'm going to tell them after an hour, gentlemen, we concluded nothing except hearing your vocabulary. What do I care about your vocabulary? Let's get down to work. Let's get down to work. Let's conclude it. Two plus two equals four. It doesn't equal five, no matter what language you use. Right. Correct? Yeah, absolutely. Let's stick, let's stick to business. Talk is cheap. Got it. Okay. So, yeah, no, look, I agree with the language piece, right? It's one thing to say, hey, you know, we have a problem, and it's another thing to say, hey, we have a challenge, There's- right? No, no, not even a challenge. There you go, Toby. There is a situation. Okay. So I would call it situation. All right. So, uh, so again, I, I know you're a super busy guy, and I told you that that uh, you know it's, we're going to do at least 15 minutes. So, I, I, I you know, Toby, it's my honor. It's my honor, my pleasure <laughs> oh, to be here you. with you. So let's Trust talk me. about let's talk about you know marketing and and well let, let, wait let me back up. So in terms of your team now, most people um, will join a team for one of three things: one, better splits. Two, uh, better training, or three, um, I can't believe I, th- I, I missed the third one. Why do people join your team? What, what, what's your unique you know, uh, selling proposition? Look, the, the split, uh, I tell you something. There's some brokers that are so adamant about the split. Oh, it must be 60%, must be 65%. No, I'm not going to move for 67%. Or even when they're making a deal, they're trying to say, okay, I'll pay you 5%. No, I want 5.2%. Right. You know, at the end of the day, first of all, the split commission uh, means everything means nothing. You can have 100% splits. But if you don't make deals, <laughs> that's just air. Right. You follow? Yeah. I always say, hey, listen, let me see how good you are. And trust me, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a visionary. If you are a good asset for me, I will not let you go out of this office. Right. But if you don't make it, I can give you even 110% split that I pay on top just to make fun about it. But you're not going to close anything. Yeah. So for me, my agents are an asset, but also on a liability, not on the legal point only, but on the point because whoever comes here you know, gets my training and stays next to me, hand to hand, you know, and it's, you know, they have my knowledge, my baggage, all my know-how and experience behind me, they have it. So it's very important, you know, that costs money. It's not for free, you know, but again, I believe in long run. I believe in volume. I don't believe in high percentage on one deal. I don't live on one deal. Yeah. I live on multiple deals. So many times, you know, sometimes, we're in the middle of a deal, and we're at the closing. I remember very well this closing, and let me tell you a very fast example, right? Okay. We were at the closing, and the apartment was like uh, $3 million. So we had the buyer's broker, and I represented the seller broker. The seller broker was in Philadelphia. My, 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 my seller was in Philadelphia. So he gave me all the powers to sign, to close. And there was a problem. I think it was like a $1,800, I think, maintenance that was all, but the lawyer didn't have enough in the escrow. And, uh, you know, the buyer said uh, something like, uh, with the lawyer said, why don't the broker share it? The buyer's broker, which I don't mention the name, obviously, they were like, uh, no, it was $900 each on a big commission, you know. Come on, man. Each. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, they were partners, the two, and they said, oh, I don't know. And I came late at the closing. So the seller lawyer know me very well, John. And John said, Rich, we have a situation. I said, yes, John, Tommy. There is eighteen hundred dollar, and uh, you know this is extra. Uh, Sandone, you know, said if you can guys split it between the two, which is the seller, the owner, and said if you can split it between the two. And I said, uh, AJ, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. And I said to them guys, the guy said, Rich, we don't know. I said, no problem. I'll take care of it. Right. No problem. It's eighteen hundred dollar, but it shows you how people are attached to the last time, you know, on the last deal. That's not the way it works, you know, because people remember that. You know, and these little, little things stain your, not only your capability, but the, the person you are. Because, you know, when you're too greedy, you get slaughtered. Always. Yeah. Pigs get always slaughtered. That's right. So don't That's forget. Right. Yeah. That's don't Kramer's that. line. Right, pigs? You know, pigs yeah. are all, so, 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 but what that, what that illustrates to me, Richard, is that, is that, they were operating out of a, a poverty mindset or a scarcity mindset, and you operate in this abundance mindset. 
Yeah. I believe I believe I know that I'm gonna make multiple deals. I know I'm making joint venture. I know I'm making investment. I know that. I'm not, I didn't come in this business thinking that this is my last deal. You kidding me? That's the first of a million every time I close one. Uh, I don't look in that way. If I look in that way, I can't even depend to get there with the subway. Right. Yeah, I agree. You know, I agree. To the closing so or, again, the, or the cab I take. So, but does this point back to to DNA, or is this something that 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 people can learn or develop? You know, having this abundance mindset. It's a very challenging question, Toby. <laughs> uh, I don't know. It has to do a lot with DNA. Well, I don't know if I'm right. You know, I tell you very frankly speaking right now. I question also myself. Sometimes I say, maybe I shouldn't. You know, maybe I should stick to that $900. You know, the universe maybe will pay me better, saying, well, you should attach to every dollar. Unfortunately, I don't see it that way. But, you know, telling you if I'm right or wrong, I don't know. Yeah. But I can tell you, yeah, it's part of your personality, who you are. Yes, it's, I would say a big percentage is who you are. Again, you know, yeah. And, uh, and it, it influences everything, uh, Toby. It influences you, who you are, how you work, what you do. Yeah, of course. I agree. Yeah. I, I mean, look, I, I, I will tell you, I, I'm very abundance mindset. But sometimes, man, sometimes I will, I will get in, I, and I don't know why, what the trigger is, but I'll get into that scarcity mindset. And, and, and I'll tell you, when I get into that mindset, um, the world looks scary to me. You know, I get no, but no, but Toby, hold on, hold on. Sorry okay. to interrupt you. No, no. You need to, you need to have that. You know why? In business, I when I invest a dollar or twenty thousand or thirty thousand for anything I do, even in a building that we want to buy now in partnership with some of my partners, I calculate everything into the last drop. You know, I'm not cheap in the sense uh, uh, for something. Like this closing immediate example, I'm not going to sit down there and negotiate for 18 hours. Guess why? Because my time works a lot per hour. Right. I'm not going to sit down there and try to find the conclusion and, and postpone the closing because that's the what I wanted, wanted, they wanted to postpone the closing. I joined it because we didn't figure out the $1,800 $1, per square the, the $1,800. Right? I, I'm not going to see them postpone it. You know why? Because with the commission check, I was buying an investment for myself. So I calculate if I lose the closing two weeks later and I don't get my commission to close my apartment and I lose it, I'm going to lose $1 million profits rather than $1,800, $900, right. or $1,800. Right. So they're cheap and cheap. When you need to be, and everything I do right now, we, we hired also a PR firm, I negotiate into the last drop. You know, because that's part of the business. Yeah. But I'm not going to, you know, if they tell me, you, you, our fee is $10,000 a month, I tell them, listen, 9000 they say, okay, last price, 9100 they say, no, 9000 I see value, you yeah. know. Well, okay, all right, so, so let's explore that a minute, right? So you see value. Now, now uh, I'm going to use language, I'm, I'm going to say something, because I want to talk about what you do within marketing. So many people will see marketing, right? If you have a poverty mindset, yes. marketing is a cost. Whereas, you know, if you have an abundance mindset, marketing is an investment. So tell me, number one, how you think about that. And then number two, how do you deploy your capital in, in terms of marketing? Marketing is a very tricky, uh, tricky business okay. in, every, in every field, especially in real estate. There's some people that they market themselves so great, so highly, <laughs> that when you sit down with them, they have no clue what real estate is. Right. It's plain simple. Yeah. It's plain truth. And I say, oh my gosh, how does a client go out with this, this broker here that represents them and doesn't even know anything about the, the building, doesn't know anything about what's the differences between a condominium or a cooperative, you know? That, to me, is blowing out my mind. I guess it's all marketing, and it is marketing. So marketing, it has two faces of the coin. The one is the one that can trigger you, exa example, this was what I just told you, a broker that has no knowledge of what's going on and has a client because he marketed himself so well and invested money in it and that he has clients and not for like half a million dollars. We're talking about five, six million dollar apartments. Okay? Yeah. So marketing must be invested in the correct way. You have to know what the message is, what is your entry set strategy is, what is your exit strategy is in the marketing. You have to know what audience you're collecting, what are you telling them and what they want exactly they're hearing from you? That's the most important thing in marketing. And marketing, you know, marketing is endless, the money you can spend. Marketing is like going to Las Vegas, which I was this weekend for a wedding of my best friend. Mm. Very, very famous guitarist, uh, Italian, that lives in America. And we're talking about marketing. You know, marketing, you can spend uh, even millions 
even oh, millions of people. Oh yeah, 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 I, and yeah, many companies endless. do. I mean, so but yeah. so what do, what do you so out of this you know so we you did two hundred transactions uh, last year and I don't, who knows what you're going to do this year? I'm sure you're going to do more. But how did you get those two hundred? What what do you do uh, in terms of marketing, or do you do any? I mean, maybe you're all word of mouth. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I didn't do a lot of marketing. I did last year marketing. Uh, you know, being also in a company like Corcoran, there's also limitation, you know, because they have the standard policy of, uh, you know, what uh, marketing you can do. Uh, but the fact that they moved to my own company, did my own company, which was planned for a while, that boosts up my marketing campaign. Uh, I actually wear a lot of uh, word of mouth. My investors, you know, all the people that invested with me, People that sold, people that you know, see all my listing, they know who I am. They all started to call me and started to come with me. And once they are with me, I guarantee you, it's very rare they leave me because I, whatever I do, I have to make sure that their money is like my money. Right. Absolutely. I always feel like I am investing my own money. So that's what my clients love, and that's why they keep referring to me clients, and they buy themselves more, and they sell with me more. So I work with a lot of investors. So investors are very cyclical. They buy and sell, they buy and sell, Mm -hmm. they buy and sell, which keeps me very busy, and they talk between each other. I also work with uh, primary owners and, uh, you know, peer-to-peer people. They're a little bit, you know, the average sales always between uh, two and four or five years. So they come back later. We always keep in touch. But, you know, they get families, they grow, they want to move out in the boroughs, they don't want to stay anymore in the city, so it's time to sell, it's time to rent. But, uh, you know, my investors are always very active and very around. So, so Richard, you know, a guy like you, you've got a lot of stuff going on, you know, you're selling real estate, you have a team, you know, you, you know you're doing a bunch of joint ventures. Uh, yep. for, for you, what keeps a guy like you, what keeps you up at night? The adrenaline. The adrenaline the passion for business, the love, the everyday challenge, everyday morning waking up, you know, I feel I'm very blessed. You know why? Let me tell you why. This is my, my answer to both questions are yes. I can't wait that it's Friday night, that I can spend time with my family, my wife, my kids, my family, and I can't wait that becomes Sunday night that comes out the morning on Monday, early morning, 6 a.m. to start the week. Yes and yes. I'm Interesting. So, so, and, and here's what I was really wanting to get at. I mean, what what concerns you? What worries you? Worries me. Yeah. Uh, worries worries me is always my my performance, I, because I set the bar always higher every time, higher every time, higher. So I put a lot of pressure on myself, a lot of pressure, and it worries me. Although I am the president and CEO, it worries me if I go under that threshold. Although it's very high every time. Sometimes I increase it even exaggerating. My wife tells me I'm, I'm crazy. My managing director, Maria Yenna, says, you know, you're going overboard sometimes. But I always try to shoot higher. You know, we have to always reach the higher goal. Yeah. Realistic. Well, this, be realistic. Yeah, I mean, this goes back to your thing about, you know, tr- just striving for perfection. Well, hey, hey Richard, this has been fantastic. We're, we're going to start wrapping up. I'm going to ask you the same last two questions I ask everybody. And the first one is this. And, and I'm very curious about your answer is I'm an aspiring agent. I have 25 bucks. What book should I go buy today? You should go and buy the book of T. Harv Ecker, The Millionaire's Mind. That's yeah. a fantastic book. I've heard a lot about I that lo- book. I love him. I think he's phenomenal. So The Millionaire's Mind, T. Harv Ecker. If, if you in the audience, if you've not read this, get a free copy. Use our link. Go to audibletrial.com slash superagentslive and, and get that book for free. Um, look, Richard. Oh, it's my, it's my, it's my, it's my little Bible. Sometimes I feel depressed, like at one night, you know, because you know everything on top of my head. You know, not every day goes your way. Yeah. I open the book. I read some quotes. T. Harvaker put me back in the spot. Got it. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna actually buy that right now. Oh, you should. Um, oh, you should, Toby. Um, okay. Well, so look. Uh, uh, you're a fascinating character, right? With a you know very rich you. history. But for you, Richard, do you feel like you have any personal habits that have contributed to your success? Well, I am uh, very, very methodical. I'm very, very uh, meticulous. I'm very precise. I like perfection. Um, in my in my work, everything I do must be perfection. And I never, when something comes, I never say, okay, I'll do it later. I do it now. If I have a meeting, I do it afterwards. Everything must be challenged and taking care of it immediately. I never wait until tomorrow 
uh, a client asks me a question, oh, I reply to him later, no. You know, chances are that I work with also overseas, so, you know, I'm working on two kinds of set of time. I go to sleep at 1, I wake up at 6. Wow. So sometimes I receive emails at 12.30 from my European investors, and they get my response. People say, you crazy, wait until the next morning. No, next morning is already late. Wow. I always say, 15 to 30 minutes, you have to reply to emails. Nowadays, the world becomes smaller, faster, and have no patience to wait. Right. Wow. So, if you... Awesome, man. Well, hey, look, uh, I wish you a great continued success. Uh, I know that you, you're, you're recruiting out there, so... Um, if anybody out there in the audience is looking to join a team and, uh, you know, you like uh, Richard and, and what he stands for, reach out. And, and look, even if you're not in New York City, I would still like you to reach out and say thank you for a guy like Richard. Very, his, he spent his valuable time sharing with me and you guys. So I appreciate it. I'll be the first guy, Richard. Thank you so much. Tell everybody where they can find you and to say thank you or, or you know, try to join your team. Yeah, of course, Toby. First of all, thank you very much and give me the honor to be here with you. And uh, to all the listeners, which I know you're a very huge, broad, uh, you know, broadcast viewers, everyone listening to you, I would say if you want to reach out to us in the CIMI group, feel free to call us at 212-571-6300 or shoot us an email at info at tngny.com or you can check also our website, which is www.tngny.com. NY.com. Again, T as in Tom, N G N Y.com. Yeah, and for everybody listening, if you're driving out there, all this stuff, I'll have, I'll have Richard's, all his contact stuff on the show notes. Just go to superagentslive.com, find Richard Nassimi, and uh, everything will be in the show notes. So don't worry about writing it down. Hey, Richard, thanks again, man. I really appreciate you coming on. Toby, I wanted also to wish all our veterans a phenomenal day. And I wanted to thank them personally on my behalf, my family, and the Nassimi Group for the great service they give our beautiful country. Yeah, that is great. Yeah, yeah and, and uh, today is uh, November 11th, and it is Ver- Veterans Day. So, all right, man, I will, I will get that out there. Thanks, bud. Thank you, Toby. See you, Bye now. Let's go. Yeah.